started. My name is Carolyn Brennan. I'm one of two co-directors here at the library. Thank you for attending tonight's program, uh, Deconstructing Murder, Exploring Patterns in Multicide. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Elizabeth Gurian, an associate professor of criminology and criminal justice at Norwich University and author of Serial and Mass Murder, Understanding Multicide Through Offending Patterns, Explanations, and Outcomes. Uh, Dr. Gurian is the Associate Director of the School of Justice Studies and Sociology at Norwich University. Her research focuses on multi-side offenders, including serial and mass murderers, lone actor terrorists, and mass shooters. In 2016, she was awarded an American Association of University Women Publication Grant for her work exploring serial murder adjudication and outcome patterns. She's published in several leading criminology journals. Welcome, Dr. Gurian. Thank you so much. Um, so I thought I would read a little bit from my book um, and then take a pause to share some case details, um, not, not too specifically, it's one of the more recent cases, but an overview, and then read a little bit more and then open up for questions. Okay. So um, the title of the talk is Deconstruct Deconstructing Murder. Um, so I'm going to talk about male serial killers, female serial killers, and female partnered serial killers. Um, so here we go. Male serial killers. While research consistently shows homicide victims are predominantly male, most victims of male perpetrated serial homicide are female. Homicide offenders also typically know their victims as friends, family, or acquaintances. But solo male serial murderers are more likely to target strangers. Previous research on solo male serial killers also shows they tend to use various methods and weapons to kill their victims, to kill locally within a small geographic area and in a time frame of three years or less. Research also indicates serial killers are predominantly male, are likely to be in their mid-20s, and are more likely to be Caucasian than Black. Like homicide in general, Serial murderers do typically kill intra-racially, meaning they kill victims within their own race. Much of the focus on serial murder is on the solo male serial killer, and this has shaped our understanding of this phenomenon through an androcentric lens, meaning a male-centric lens. Serial killer anniversaries of male serial killers and their murders, death, or parole denials offer the media opportunities for an annual introspective on these cases. For example, 2019 marked the 30-year anniversary of Ted Bundy's execution. While we know specific details of Bundy, for example, that he is consistently identified as one of the most notorious serial killers in history due to his intelligence, appearance, evasion of police and custody escapes, and brutality of his murders, far less attention is given to his victims, with the exception of how many he killed, and that they were generally college-aged, dark-haired women. By consistently identifying the same notorious solo male serial killers as the prototype for all serial killers, we lose the opportunity to learn not only about other types of solo male serial killers, such as Gary Heidnick, who we'll talk about um, as the case study a bit further in this talk, but also about gender differences and co-offending dynamics among other types of serial killers. Female serial killers. Solo female serial killers who consist of the smallest group compared to solo male or partnered serial killers tend to target intimates or family members, use poison or medication to kill, and kill locally or in a specific place within a time frame of six years or less. Female offenders also tend to kill victims who are categorized as low facilitation murders meaning victims who may be killed with less difficulty, such as children, the elderly, or the sick. It was not until after the arrest of serial murderer Eileen Wernos in 1991 that the FBI labeled her the first American female serial murderer, seemingly because she fitted the general public of a male serial murderer. She killed her victims with a gun, she was physically strong and aggressive, and she experienced several of the common characteristics of serial murderers, including a history of physical or sexual abuse, substance abuse, poor family environment, 
and or potential brain damage. However, it can be argued that Vernos was neither the first American female serial murderer, nor was she a typical one. Cases of female serial murderers have existed for hundreds of years, but are less commonly known or reported on compared to solo male serial killers. For example, when asked about 19th century serial killers, most would indicate knowing something about Jack the Ripper, but few are likely to know anything about Amelia Dyer or Marianne Cotton, even though they are each estimated to have killed four times the number of victims than Jack. More recently, Ianu states that there has been, quote, an increased degree of interest in serial murder, further noting, quote, Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, Henry Lee Lucas, Kenneth Bianchi, and Angelo Buono, David Berkowitz, Jeffrey Dahmer, Richard Ramirez, and Albert DeSalvo are a few of the serial killers that have both terrorized and fascinated the public, end quote. Not one of the several serial killers listed by her is a woman. Vronsky estimates women comprised approximately one-fifth of all active serial murderers between 1800 and 1995. Although female serial killers are rarer than male serial killers, Eric Hickey indicates the gender ratio among serial murderers, about 83% male, is less pronounced for homicide in general, about 90% male. So basically, if you're a woman and you're committing murder, you're more likely to commit serial murder than a one-off, according to Eric Hickey's statistics. In making these observations, it is important to reiterate that our understanding of serial murder is limited by definitions and classifications that label female serial killers like Eileen Mornos as anomalies, lump them under classifications developed on solo male serial killers, or exclude or ignore them altogether. Research has shown female offenders operate over twice the amount of time as their male counterparts. This may be due to victim and method selection, which is explored later in my book, which I hope you read. Although female serial killers predominantly operate alone, uh, researchers have found approximately 32% kill with a male or female partner. And lastly, partnered serial killers. Previous research on partnered serial killers show they tend to target adult strangers, use various weapons and methods to kill their victims, and kill locally within a time frame of two years or less. Researchers indicate differing percentages of serial killers working in teams, from 25% to one third. Research also indicates males are more likely to be the dominant partner in mixed sex teams, while less than half of these teams have at least one female. Morris argues learning crime includes both techniques and rationalizations, justifications, and attitudes, similarly echoed in Sykes and Motta's, uh, Motta's techniques of neutralization. Gunn suggests, quote, it may be that team killers are more often thrill seekers, and the presence of a partner may legitimize their acts, resulting in less guilt and therefore greater deviancy. As such, gender role socialization may also play a role and the differences between solo female perpetrators and those who work as part of a team. For female offenders to defy societal expectations of her sex with masculine forms of violence requires a kind of permission. Partnering with a male offender might open a pathway for young women to commit violent crimes that are not commonly associated with female offenders, including criminal homicide and sexual assaults. Sexual sadists are thought to use a variety of verbal, physical, and sexual behaviors through the domination, control, and suffering of partners. These behaviors are designed to establish, in the most violent instances of behavior, the sense of having ultimate control over the life and death of another. Under this model, males are given extraordinary powers of control and coercion, but females are regarded as weak and vulnerable. Hickey suggests serial murderers rarely seek out those who are as physically or intellectually capable as themselves to murder. Instead, by either, either randomly or carefully targeting victims, serial murderers mentally and or physically stalk their play, prey. This paradigm suggests that the female accomplice must be too intelligent to serve <coughs> as a proper victim 
but weak enough to be manipulated. And so I'll dissect to this um, paradigm of the Gary Heidnick case that I won't go into too detail. Um, so if any of you have seen um, Silence of the Lambs? So if, if you have, um, one of the main serial killers um, in that movie is Buffalo Bill. Buffalo Bill is partly uh, based on Gary Heidnick. Gary Heidnick was a serial killer in Pennsylvania who kidnapped, um, he was white, who kidnapped young African-American women and kept them prisoner in his basement. There was a pit that he used to torture them, not unlike the well uh, with Buffalo Bill. But he developed a system where there was one victim that he preferred among all the others, and her name was Josefina Rivera. She, um, she was able at times to go upstairs um, and he would you know, um, put her in charge of the other victims if he had to go out. Um, he also was very careful to have her execute one of the victims. Um, so she actually electrocuted one of the victims and then he forced her to write a letter saying that she had done so. Um, in order to uh, further keep her captive. As soon as she was able to gain enough of his trust where she said, uh, basically, it would be very helpful if you would let me visit my family so that they would not be concerned um, that I'm, um, you know, that they would theoretically stop looking for her and be assuaged that she was fine. He agreed. As soon as he allowed this to happen, she went immediately to the police and rescued the other victims. So this is um, an interesting case because standard definitions of serial murder is two or more victims to be classified. Technically, Gary Heidnick killed neither. Um, one victim died by neglect. He's basically stopped feeding her. And then the other, as I indicated, he forced. Josephina to electrocute. However, Josephina's role in that um, serial murder crime is often ignored or overlooked or erased in a lot of the narratives. So I'm going to continue on. Um, so my book also has several case studies. Um, I use an integrated case study approach where I use court documents, media documents, I try to pull in quotes from surviving family um, to give a very well-rounded case study. So, um, Rivera is quoted, and so Josephine is the surviving victim, in regard to the Heidnick case um, that he forced her to electrocute one of the victims, an act that she believed refusal to commit would have prompted Heidnick to kill her instead. Quote, I remember putting the wires on her chains. People don't think it bothers me, but it really, really does. Josephina Rivera explained her actions and that she planned to save the women and the chance to get away from Heidnick without drawing suspicion presented itself, and she'd take it and call the police so they could nab him before we could return to the house or escape. Josephina Rivera argued that the appropriate treatment for Gary Heidnick should not have been the death penalty. So he was executed by the state of Pennsylvania for his crimes. But she said, quote, let him sit there suffering like we did. The mental fatigue of being in a room and only being allowed out one hour a day is exactly what he did to us. Leaving him there would have been worse than killing him. He wanted to die famous, and that's just what he did. By erasing Rivera from this case, we are left with a partial picture of what occurred and fail to appreciate the role she played in rescuing Heidnick's other victims. It is important to note how aspects of this case relate to theories of obedience and authority. Rather than the general practice by the criminal justice system and media of omitting Rivera from the case narrative, authority and obedience theories may have been useful in helping to explain her role as a victimized proxy in this case, meaning a victim who is forced to participate in the crimes for their own survival or that of the other victims. This case also demonstrates how certain narratives of female criminality, for example, prostitution, victimization, and experiences from 
other ethnicities are erased or ignored within the public domain. Women such as Rivera fall into a complex category of female and ethnic minority, which may render them invisible victims. In general, serial homicide is usually intraracial. Offenders kill within their own race or ethnicity, although there are clearly exceptions. Another difficulty in gathering my sample of offenders resulted from the non-inclusion of some women in partnered serial murder cases. For example, the Clint Eastwood film Changeling in 2008 centers on the Wineville Chicken Creek murders, which occurred in California in 1928. However, Gordon Northcott's mother, Sarah, was completely erased from the narrative in the movie. Gordon and Sarah were both convicted of murder, with Sarah receiving life imprisonment, but later paroled, and Gordon was sentenced to death and hanged in 1930. Gordon's nephew, Sanford Clark, a young teenager at the time of the murders, would also classify as the victimized proxy, and that he was raped and beaten by his uncle, forced to dispose of the bodies, and ordered at gunpoint to shoot one of the other victims. There are likely more cases of partnered serial murder that would fit the parameters of my study, but due to the difficulty in detecting these cases, due to the erasure or ignorance of the victim's roles, they remain undiscovered. So that is all I plan to read from, and then I would like to open it up to questions. So Michelle has a hand up. So I should I just call on Michelle? Yeah, I guess she has a question. I'm just typing that people are welcome to ask questions in the chat function if you're on Zoom. I answered everything. <laughs> That's a first. Well, I found it very interesting that it is a defined period of time during which one is perpetrated. Yes. What? Why? I mean, if with with matters of the shorter periods in women. So that if you're living past your harvest days, you just stop. So for those in the um, Zoom crowd, if you can hear, Keith was asking about kind of the time frame of these murders. So my research has shown solo male and partners usually kill in a year or less. With solo males, we'll start with them, um, likely because they are um, killing strangers. Um, they are, some serial killers are known to target what's known as the less dead, prostitutes, runaways, the elderly, people who are less likely to be um, sought after by neighbors, friends, family. But killing um, usually within a local area so that police are able to make connections that there is an active serial killer in a particular area. Partnered serial killers, usually there's, um, if there's two or more people killing together, there's a dynamic where it's unstable. And at some point, one or the other is going to turn on the other in order um, to get a plea bargain if they know the police are closing in. With solo female serial killers, was about five years or so, and that's because of the continued reluctance of society and the criminal justice system to recognize that women are capable of committing murder. So a lot of your female serial killers are targeting their families um, or are in the medical profession where it may be easier to, um, to make the excuse that patients were sick and dying rather than recognizing, oh wow, we have a serial killer in our midst. Um, there's another case, uh, Mary Beth Tinning, who had several children um, die over a period of years. And the theory is that she enjoyed the funerals and the community coming together 
with her to grieve. And they attributed SIDS um, to the death of those children or some kind of genetic disorder. And then it wasn't until an adopted child died um, that they realized that was not the reason um, that so many of her children were, were dying. Um, so in, in terms of serial killer, yes, there's distinct time frames, but it usually comes down to who they're targeting, the methods that they're using, um, and then you know, police are getting much more sophisticated in talking to each other and in recognizing, you know, unfortunately, if a group of prostitutes um, are being killed, even across states, in, in today's era, they're more likely to talk to each other than they would have been back in the 70s and 80s. Right. Because when you were saying that, I recall the case that happened in Canada mm -hmm. where there had been a series of disappearances mm -hmm. within the gay village in yeah. Toronto. Yep. And it was where people of color, immigrants, the sort of homeless community, and then all of a sudden they stopped. Mm -hmm. And then they finally were able to identify the perpetrator. It was because his business had moved him to a new location. Yeah. So I was very interested in that. You know, was it that kind of circumstances that usually disrupt it, mm -hmm. or it just sort of would have occurred on its own? So I, my research is from 1900 to present day, right. international, but. If we want to take a look at a case like Jack the River, right? right? Notorious case, his identity, every couple of years, someone writes a book, they're absolutely positive <laughs> that they've identified him. <laughs> but the theory is that Jack either was executed for his crimes, but never um, confessed to being Jack the River, that he moved away. Um, and continued committing crime elsewhere, or that you know there was enough of a shock, he was too close to being captured that he stopped for a period of time. A more recent case, Dennis Rader, the BTK killer in Wichita, Kansas, had a, a family, um, a wife and kids, and lived in a neighborhood, and um, would you know break into other people's homes and find torturing and kill um, people. But there's a a period of time where he stopped killing. And one of the predominant theories is that he became a compliant officer, meaning he could go around the neighborhood and say, you need to tie up your dog, your grass is too high. And something about that power and control that he had over other people replaced his need to kill. I don't know that I buy into that, but there's potentially something there. What we do know was that the Wichita Press um, published a retrospective saying, hey, a BTK killer was never caught. Isn't that crazy? And then he started reaching out to them anonymously to say, I'm still here. And then they were able to um, see that he had logged into a church computer um, and capture him that way. So this idea of serial killers and ego um, when it comes to male serial killers, pretty well documented. Um, but yes, usually as predators, they don't want to be caught. And so if they do, um, if the, the killings abruptly end, it's usually because they moved to some other place, died or got really sick, um, or felt like the police were closing in and had to, to put a um, stop for X amount of time. Yeah. How frequently does that happen? How, how often do serial killers stop and and then not ever get caught. So if we think about um, homicide as a type of crime, it's roughly 1% of all crimes are homicide. Serial murder is about 0.01%. <laughs> so in order to generalize to questions like that, you're talking about a teeny tiny fraction of a teeny tiny fraction. Um, there's the notorious cases that I can out of the air, but to provide any kind of a general statement, it's too small a sample to say definitively. Yes. So Phil is for reading your book, but while reading, I noticed that um, you have end notes where you list the victims' names. Can you talk about that? Yeah, thank you. So um, the question was about um, 
about highlighting the victim themes in the book. And so this was something that I was very conscious with. Um, one of the case studies that I include is Ted Bundy, right? Notorious, there was just a Zac Efron sensational movie on Netflix where his head looks beautiful because he's portrayed by Zac Efron. And when, when I was doing my research, you know, I tried to find a comprehensive list of the victims and I had to go to multiple sources and cross check multiple things against each other because the focus is not on the victims. It's on Ted Bundy, it's on the anniversary of his execution or when he escaped or any of those, you know, um, you know, the, the date he was convicted. That's what, you know, the, the public is mostly interested in. The media also plays into that by having these, you know, Charles Manson is dead, but we have not seen the end of Charles Manson documentaries by a long shot. So I was very conscious anytime I mention an offender in the book, whether it's an actual case study or even in passing within the text, I make sure to acknowledge the victims who were killed. Um, I would love to do more with victims in these crimes. Um, I have a student who's currently working with me on that, that idea of the less dead. Of um, We're hoping to publish in a peer-reviewed journal of actually, so it's a term that was coined in the 1990s, but I think that there are a lot of other marginalized groups that could be included now in that somewhat dated category to really shine a focus on the victims. They are an integral part of these stories, but they often get overlooked because of, you know, we're fascinated by these serial killers. Why did they kill? You know, the motivation is, you know, something that we're, we're intrinsically fascinated with, but I'm trying to flip the script a little bit to draw some attention back to the victims. Great. Thank you for doing that because, again, remember the case in Canada, it was this was an immigrant population, these were people of color. These were people who didn't come. Yeah. So nobody was really looking for them. When you were talking about women, you made a reference to significant histories of some type of domestic sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. Is that true with male perpetrators as well? So this is, you know, one of the, the trillion dollar question, why do serial killers do what they do? Um, you will see serial killers claiming histories of childhood abuse, but sadly, we know millions of children are abused every year and don't go on to commit any violence whatsoever, let alone serial murder. So it can't be just that. So then you need to look at, um, you know, was there a traumatic brain injury? Um, was there, you know, something um, growing up, attachment theory? Did they have poor parental or guardian figures who didn't teach them empathy? It's not one thing, um, but we do commonly see, you know, especially when they go through the courts and you're trying to find mitigating factors, something to pull the death penalty off the table, you may see claims of childhood abuse, um, whether they're accurate or happened, um, those are, that's more difficult to determine. So out of this large group of survivors of abuse, a very small portion are those that go on to become perpetrators themselves? Minuscule. That's right. Yeah. Same as mental illness, right? right? So if you want to look at a another right. mitigating factor, you know, we have a lot of people who have mental illness in the country who do not commit any violence. But we see, and the book also does talk about mass murder. There's a lot of conversation in the media and the public about mental illness and mass murder, um, separate from serial killers, which is more childhood abuse and, and other factors. Um, but millions of people have mental illness and do not commit any kind of violence, let alone, you know, these kinds of mass acts of horror. Do you address in the book um, uh, methods of kids that have been already seen to be killing animals, hurting, self-limiting, whatever, mm -hmm. that, that are shown tendencies? Um, do you, are there methods that people are using to 
figure out how to stop that or yeah. assuage it? So there's two ways to answer that question. One is the, the classic MacArthur triad, which was a study that I think looked at 20 some odd white male serial killers and determined that a large majority of them went to bed, committed arson, or set fires, or killed animals. But that doesn't apply to all serial killers. It applies to that small group. But that's what we usually see in the movies. And you know, same with Ted Bundy and his white band. We see like all of these tropes of serial murder. I do, at the end of the book, talk about red flags and leakage um, and things that, you know, for example, schools, because um, I talk about school shootings, things that we should be alert to. Um, and some of that is linked to suicide research where people start giving away their property. They start, you know, telling their friends, their close friends, don't come to school on X day. These are the kinds of things that we should be taking very seriously. And because most researchers either study serial murder or mass murder, I think this book um, is an attempt to look at both serial and mass murder, compare them, and then I also look at lone actor terrorism and mass shooters. So it's meant to be a really comprehensive look at, so the term is multicide, killing multiple people, um, and how the resources that we use to stop serial murder, to stop mass murder, these agencies and organizations should actually be talking to each other because there's a lot of red flags and leakage in all of these different types of fields that there's resources that should be applied to the different types of homicide. I had a question. Um, yeah. you, talk, you talked about the, the victim proxy. Yes. And I just, I just wanted you to talk about that a little bit more. Um, I know that like of the small percentage of the small percentage, that's gonna be like a really, really small percentage, but I just kind of wanted to hear about, you know, how common that is, you know, that if you've got, if you've got partners or you've, you know, just how common that is. Yeah, thanks Michelle. So it's, um, the term is a victimized proxy. So again, it's someone who has been forced to um, kill or participate in the crimes for their own safety or the safety of the other victims. And that's another part of my research is trying to identify these cases. So as I noted, you know, with Josefina Rivera, it was, if you read the media accounts, they say Gary Heidnick electrocuted the victim. Gary did this. And if you keep reading and you keep, you know, scratching below the surface and looking at these cases, you start to see okay, it's in the court documents, they say he forced her to write a letter, and then you follow that trail. Um, there's three cases that I have clearly identified. Um, so Sanford Clark, the, the young boy as well, that I mentioned. Um, and then there was another male serial killer who used one of his victims to, um, to procure other victims. So if you're a male operating alone, it's obviously really difficult to get young women to come to your car, but if they see there's another young woman in that car, they may be more likely to accept a ride um, or all of these, these other things that then result in murder. So um, in answer to your question, like I, I imagine it's a small percentage, but my hope is if this term becomes recognized as people are exploring these cases, I could start to develop a database as you know, people reach out and say, I found a case, does this match your parameter? Um, or I have lots of students at Norwich University that this would make the perfect project for them to go back through and look at these cases and see like, were the women simply erased from these narratives and do that same, you know, following the path that I did with at least these three other cases. Um, definitely my next area of research, definitely focusing on the victims of these crimes is something I'm super interested in. Another phase of my research is with the death penalty. Um, so we know that if you are a black offender who kills a white victim, you are far more likely to be sentenced to death and executed. 
the difficulty with these cases is when you have larger numbers of victims, getting something basic, like the race or ethnicity of the victim, is very difficult. The media will report on their name, often their age and their gender, and that's it. So this is where I have 1,600 cases in my data set. Um, for me to find like one question like this means I need student help um, to kind of track down these research questions and help me answer them. It's fascinating that that data doesn't already exist somewhere, that that's, that that's really been consistently overlooked throughout an entire century. Agreed. And, you know, in the media, after Sandy Hook, got a little bit better about turning the attention away from the offender and focusing on the victims, but we see kind of ebbs and flows with the media and what the public's interested in, um, where, especially when it's these school shootings or massacres at a mall or, or a workplace, sometimes you know, the, the victims get the priority, and then other times we go back to that obsession with the offender. Well, then. So, when you were asking that question, and what I was thinking of is some of that goes back to what we require law enforcement to capture and report. Mm -hmm. I mean, looking at a lot of the data that's coming out now about profiling those or whatever, is how many law enforcement officers or agencies are not required to capture this? Mm -hmm. So you're not going to get an Elizabeth for a victim if you're not capturing it for a perpetrator. Right. Okay. Now with Sandy Hook, there was significant, or there there is a whole a whole piece of, of blowback and victim shaming and aggression against the victims. Yes. Yeah, kids. Uh, is, is that something that's present in other places when when the when the tragedy surrounding victims has been highlighted more more by the media, or is, has that happened so little that you couldn't make any sort of so judgment? This is without getting too far into the gruesome details of the Heidnik case, but these were young African American women, some of whom were prostitutes who accompanied Gary Heidnik. Um, and the press was very cool to them. Um, they called them Heidnik girls. They, you know, shouted other insults at them as they were entering the courtroom. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's sometimes, you know, an, an ignorance of what these victims have gone through. Um, and of course, you know, with Sandy Hook, there's the whole conspiracy and did it actually happen? And all of those other um, theories and fake news out there. Um, but I have seen it also in these serial murder cases where you think you would have nothing but empathy for these women who survived this you know, horrific um, ordeal. And yet, I think based on age, race, socioeconomic status, you know, if you're not the you know, young, blonde, female, you get a different type of attention. Um, yeah. Is part of the um, non-publication of, of the victim to, is it intended to not re-victimize them? I mean, just partially? Sure. So um, I do, and I worry too by highlighting Josephina in my book that like, I sincerely do not want to re-victimize her. I, I want her to be viewed as a hero, like she saved these women, and to change that narrative of how she's been viewed for all of these years. Um, but I think, and maybe by attributing the murder to Gary Heidnick, there was some element of trying to protect her, of not villainizing her even further, um, as the press did by, you know, by insulting her um, occupation, for lack of a better word. Um, but these are things that, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to celebrate women like her um, and to give them, you know, the, the honor that should have been due to them at the 
the time that she risked her life to save these other women. And I think a lot of that got ignored by the press. What, what, what is it that, it just, it seems like there's a tendency to romanticize, serial killers. Yeah. It just seems, just, I don't know, I just seems. Well, if you look at Ted Bundy, he's not that attractive. But then they got Zac Efron to play him in that Netflix movie, which, and my understanding is there's another Ted Bundy movie coming out soon. Um, there's something, I think, about, so I study serial murder because I'm fascinated by human behavior. And I think for the public, serial murder represents this thing that we can't even begin to grasp that not only can someone kill one person, but they can do it multiple times. And things, you know, people like Jack the Ripper um, are especially exciting because he's never been caught. And so the whole thing with the Zodiac <coughs> killer, you know, people are desperate for, for us to have found the identity of the Zodiac killer because it's like a mystery you're trying to solve. You're trying to understand human behavior and this complex puzzle of someone who is willing to break every societal norm and not just kill one person, but kill multiple people. I think it's endlessly fascinating to all different sectors of the Cuban population. As an academic, as someone who loves Netflix, as you know, someone who knows a neighbor, who knows a neighbor, who was neighbors with Ted Bundy back in the day. Like these are the stories that we share with each other because it's such a complex phenomenon to wrap our brains around. On that note, can you talk a little bit more about what it's like to do the work that you do? Sure. So I was the girl who was reading scary stories to tell in the dark when I was much too young, who was reading Stephen King and Dean Hoots when I was much too young. And um, my family, most of them are in medicine. So I was going to be a real doctor, be a medical doctor, um, and you know went to Boston University, got my undergraduate degree in human physiology, which trained me as a scientist, which I'm forever grateful for. But um, my my senior year, you do an internship, and I ended up at Children's Hospital in Boston, where I was working on genetics and psychiatry research, and dream. They hired me straight out of college. They had gotten a major grant. I was the laboratory manager. And I stayed with them for five years. Um, over that time, 9-11 happened. I realized I will always love medicine, but it wasn't the right fit. And Northeastern was down the street. Um, James Fox, national expert on serial and mass murders, a professor there. I applied and got in. Um, he was my master's thesis advisor. I did a case, um, Carla Homolka and Paul Bernardo up in Canada. And then that opened the door for my doctoral research, which I did at the University of Cambridge. Um, Dr. Lorraine Gelsthorpe was my doctoral supervisor. I studied, um, enhanced my study to all female serial killers and all partnered serial killers um, and did that research. Then I worked for the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime um, for five months on a global homicide report. And then Norwich was hiring. Um, I was born and raised in Rhode Island, so I'm a New Englander through and through. Had never really lived in Vermont. We used to go skiing in New Hampshire. Um, but, um, we ended up, um, I applied for a lectureship and got it. And then the following year, they opened the tenure line. So Norwich has been great because it's a teaching university, but it has allowed me to really develop my research. If I was at a top tier research university, I don't know that this, this book would have happened. It probably would have been just serial murder. I wouldn't have been able to explore the different dimensions of multicide. Um, and I've had so much student help 
over the years and faculty health and faculty development health um, that this is the culmination of basically 15 years if you go all the way back to my master's degree and that first interest um, in criminal justice and then now the next phase um, is to hopefully do prisons research to either surveys or actually interview the offenders um, would be to get their own personal narratives of their childhood to see what stories they have about you know were they abused as children did they not have um, attachment to their um, parental figures or guardians and to really hear from them um, and not just the solo males but the females and the partner as well to get kind of a more well-rounded um, narrative of what's going on with these offenders that's the 40-year plan <laughs> because <laughs> prisons research and there's a lot of red tape and a lot of um, different hoops that you have to go through understandably but um yeah i feel like I've, i'm just at the beginning of some cool stuff to be back on that question um this is dark stuff right yeah. how do you compartmentalize this part of your life of like you're a really normal fun person <laughs> like how if someone on the street next they would have no idea like yeah. and i've been there when you say what you you study and they're like what yeah it's so cool but also like you would never get that how do you compartmentalize this and like not like take them home like yeah and working with students like how do you prepare the students that you work with for this type of work so you 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 can't do it in giant massive chunks so when i have students who have a research question i say like do one or two cases a day, don't do 15, because you're gonna get immersed in these details and it can be very depressing. The way that I frame it is, um, great white sharks terrify me. You can't pay me to get into a cage in Australia, but I am grateful that there are people who can do that and who can tell us all of these fascinating things about these, frankly, they're very creepy creatures. For whatever reason, I can do that with serial murder. It doesn't scare me, it doesn't upset me. I, somehow I do compartmentalize it so that I don't take it home with me. Um, when I'm done, you know, writing a chapter or writing a thing, I'm done. And I think um, I think that's important, right? Like we need people who are skilled at the, the hard jobs that other people want to learn about, but don't be the one, want to be the ones to do it. Right? And you know, Disney movies and friends and coffee dates and talks at the local library and you know, all of these things to just kind of normalize it as like, this is my job and this is what I do. Is there anybody on Zoom who wants to ask something either in the chat or by um, unmuting yourself? You're welcome to do that as well. It's a rainy Monday night. <laughs> <laughs> think I can actually hear the rain. Do you have a favorite case or I know I don't know favorite's probably not the right word. Yeah, it's not the right word. I've learned but, that over time. Yeah, <laughs> um, but do you have one that, that they, they start with? like what's one that's do they find very compelling or you find so uh, I don't know that, that that has really informed your research? Is it is it the, the case study? That you were talking about? Yeah, definitely the high neck case. Um, also, so I did my, I alluded to this, I did my master's thesis on um, Carl Hamolka and Paul Bernardo. Mm -hmm. So this was a case that happened in Canada, roughly the same time as OJ Simpson. So we didn't really hear about it in America. Um, they were a husband and wife. She, um, and he was known as a Scarborough rapist. It's pretty clear that she knew that 
um, when they got married. She worked at a veterinarian's office, and he started to become interested in her younger sister. One Christmas, she got um, medication, anesthetics, from the veterinarian office and knocked out her sister. Um, and they raped her, and then she choked on her vomit and died. And they got away with it, because viewed as a tragic accident. And then they kidnapped, raped, and tortured two other young girls. And the police started closing in on Paul Bernardo as a Scarborough rapist. Um, it seems that Carla was aware of that. And cut, she uh, cut a plea bargain. She got 12 years for the murder of these three young women, one of whom was her sister. And then they found videotapes showing her participating in the rape and torture of the young girls. And so the Canadians, the public, had viewed her as this poor, sympathetic, battered wife of this horrible monster, and then come to find out she was um, as complicit, if not at times more complicit, than he was in terms of helping to procure the victims. And so that was the case that started the doctoral dissertation of if they hadn't found those videotapes, she would have gone down in history as this poor battered wife of this horrific monster. And so that concept of the role of the woman, her agency in these cases really piqued my curiosity of the kinds of excuses and rationales that we give women that we don't give to men in the criminal justice system, in the media, in society, and how we view them very differently. And so that's probably the case that sparked this whole journey. But then along the ways, um, the Gary Hynek and Josephine Rivera um, and her role in that, um, that case is um, really inspired me to look more carefully at the victims in these cases and not fall into the same trap of glamorizing serial killers and sensationalizing them and turning them into these, you know, glamorous psychopaths. Um, but to actually capture the victims' narratives as much as I can in these stories. The juxtaposition of those is really interesting too, because in one you have somebody who was who was Josephina was was attacked and abused even by the press afterward, even mm -hmm. though she was a victimized proxy. And then um, uh, Hamolka was one that was treated as though they, she was a victimized proxy, and then and then was found out after the fact. And the difference was with the Hamolka Bernardo case; they were known as the Ken and Barbie killers ah, because they were young they were and blonde and very attractive. Mm -hmm. And Caucasian. And Caucasian. And so that was why the initial impulse was to treat her as this poor battered wife. And then were horrified when those videotapes were found um, to show how complicit she was in the actual um, crimes themselves. Huh. Do you think it's also a tendency that people want, it's okay for men to be powerful? Yes. And murderers? Yes. Um, but we want our women. Um, don't include me in on it, but <laughs> we want our women to be powerless and soft. Yep. Yep. And, and, and so we don't want to look at, at the powerful women who are murderous. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, the book, well, this was a dream to write because it includes a lot of the historical stuff that has fascinated me. I mean, growing up in Rhode Island, we knew about the Salem witch trials, and we go to Salem, and so the the idea of witchcraft, of, you know, these were women who were powerful in their communities or who had, you know, insulted someone powerful and then they were able to, you know, turn around and um, hang them or stone them. You know, there's, there's a lot of an, historical information in the book, the use that women use poison um, historically, arsenic, which is viewed as a very devious way to kill your family or your children. It's very underhanded. Um, and you know, these are the kinds of crimes where you would be hanged for murdering your family with arsenic um, versus you know, a, a man who would stab someone to death. You know, well, that's a crime of passion that's different. And so these are you know, historically, culturally, societally, 
there's all kinds of different lenses to use when we look at the offenders and victims in these cases, from race, social class, gender, age, the full gamut. Yeah, it's interesting to think if that partnership was a, a man and a man, you would assume that the other man was completely complicit from the get go. Yeah. And, and do you find, are there partnerships that are same gender? Yes. So in my original dissertation um, at Cambridge, I was mostly interested in at least one female as part of that team because I was trying to tease out that question of agency. But I've sensed my research now includes same-sex teams, women committing crimes with other women and committing crimes with the other men. What's interesting is that partnered mass murder, the numbers are incredibly low. So partnered serial killers, there's the expectation that they're going to keep killing and that they're going to get away with it a long time. When it comes to partnered mass murder, there's more of an expectation that it's not going to end with both of them surviving. And so getting people to agree to that kind of a contract, I have a much smaller sample size in the partnered mass, um, but it does include same-sex teams like the Columbine killers were both um, young men. interesting example with the column with Columbine because when when you were talking about uh, these gender differences these partnerships I assume romantic attachment mm -hmm. and in Columbine there wasn't any yeah. are, is there frequently if, if there are, are are teams that are committing multicide are they is there typically romantic attachment or is it a platonic partnership and partner yes partnered serial killer yes because there's usually a sexual element to those crimes where um, a man and a woman are targeting young female victims. Mm -hmm. When it comes to um, partnered mass murderers, usually they have a same ideology for lack of a better word. So mm -hmm. the Columbine killers both felt um, isolated from the rest of the school and made you know, this contract to um, go in and kill as many people as possible and then um, commit suicide themselves. Yeah, the Sarnaevs, the Boston Bombers. Um, you see Sniper, is that serial though, right? You see Sniper was serial, but also, so this is, you know, again, why with my book, I look at lone actor terrorism and mass shooters also because there's a tendency to lump terrorism as this separate group because ideologically it's different from mass shootings. But what my research shows is if you look at the actual incident, you are still creating terror. You are still creating fear in a community and whether or not it's religious or governmental based or you know, some other ideological reason, there are more similarities than there are differences between terrorism and um, mass shooter, which is a type of mass murder. And then lone actor terrorism is kind of that bridge between mass murder and terrorism that I'm also trying to draw more attention to again with resources, like all of these different agencies should be talking to each other um, and not just lumped in the terrorism world or the mass murder world. Are there any that like we all so thank you, Steph. Um, so Ted, Ted Kaczynski. Um, it, so depending who you ask, which type of researcher, he is either a serial killer, because he did kill multiple victims over a period of time, or a lone actor terrorist, because he had the whole manifesto with the anti-industrial revolution complex. He attempted to uh, put a bomb on an airplane and it was unsuccessful, but if he had been successful, then he also would have been a mass murderer. So he, I talk about gray zones in the book and how these categories are meant to be mutually exclusive, that you can't be a serial killer and a mass murderer 
or a serial killer and a lone actor terrorism or any combination of those. But Ted Kaczynski is both a serial killer and a lone actor terrorist. You get very passionate when you talk about your research. <laughs> Yeah, well, that puts us right at our time. Great. Yeah. We do have a comment. Um, it says, thank you for this wonderful program. So I'll pass that along. Thank you. And thank you to my Zoom crowd and my real crowd. It was really, um, I love talking about my research and um, glad I could share of Rainy. Monday night um, in October on the cusp of Halloween to talk about serial and mass murder with all of you. Great. <laughs> <laughs>